All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's SOAR webinar on building and sustaining collaborations with medical providers. My name is Kristen Lupfer. I'm the project director of the SAMHSA SOAR TA Center, and I'll be your moderator today. So before we begin, a few items to review. This training is supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The contents of this presentation don't necessarily reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA or DHHS, and the training should not be considered substitutes for individualized care and treatment decisions. So just a few instructions before we begin. The slides, the materials, the presenter bio, bios are all available on the SoarWorks website um, on the events page. Um, so you can follow the link um, here and we'll put that in the chat again. You also um, can find the link to these materials in your reminder emails that you got directly from Zoom, and you'll receive an email after the webinar with a link to the materials as well. There will be a recording available within approximately a week um, on the SOAR website and later available on SAMHSA's YouTube as well. Uh, the chat um, is disabled and all participant lines will be muted, um, so all questions can come through the Q&A feature um, on Zoom, so feel free to use that to submit questions that you have uh, for our presenters during the presentation, and we'll address all of those questions at the end. For accessibility, we have ASL interpretation and live captioning services um, provided for you. Um, to view those captions, click on the CC icon uh, that you see at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. Mm -hmm. For the evaluation, your browser will redirect you to a survey following the webinar. We would really appreciate you completing that survey and giving us feedback. It helps to inform our future planning um, and improve uh, this experience for you all. So I'm really pleased uh, to introduce you to uh, Doreen Gross, the PATH Program Coordinator in SOAR Corps with the Division of State and Community Systems Development at the Center for Mental Health Services at SAMHSA, who will give our welcome today. Doreen? Thank you. Thank you, Kristen, and welcome to everyone uh, joining us today. We're delighted that you're here. Um, beyond, on behalf of SAMHSA, I would like to welcome you uh, to this web SOAR webinar titled Building and Sustaining SOAR collaborations with medical providers. Uh, one of our identified SOAR critical components is obtaining and submitting medical documentation as a part of the quality of a quality and complete SOAR assisted application. In order to do this, SOAR providers must work collaboratively with SOAR applicants and their treating sources. So to help us put this uh, information into practice, uh, we'll hear from SOAR practitioners, a physician, um, social, um, I mean, SOAR beneficiaries who will uh, share strategies on how they work collaboratively uh, to gather the necessary document, medical documentation. I would like to, wel to uh, welcome and thank our presenters for uh, your willingness to share your expertise and experience with building collaborations with medical providers um, as well. Okay, and I will turn it back over to Christian Luper, who will be moderating today's uh, webinar. Christian? Yeah, thank you so much, Doreen. Um, all right, uh, Alicia, if you could help uh, take us back another slide. I think we accidentally got moved forward. Perfect. All right, so it's our intention today that by the end of this webinar, you all will understand the importance of building and sustaining relationships with medical providers, both inside and outside of your agency, be able to apply strategies to working collaboratively with SOAR applicants and their treating sources on developing those quality SOAR-assisted SSI and SSDI applications and treatment plans, and also to educate medical providers on the SOAR model and SSA disability criteria. So to reach these objectives, we are so fortunate uh, to have uh, our panelists today. Um, and Alicia, if you could help me with that, advancing the slide. Thank you so much. Um, so we have uh, Tracy Fugelstad, uh, SOAR Benefits Specialist and SOAR Local Lead at the Soulsbacher Center in Jacksonville, Florida. We've got um, with her today, Dr. Abby Krishna, 
um, who's a psychiatry year four resident with the Dr. Richard Christensen Community Psychiatry Fellow at the University of Florida, also in Jacksonville. Uh, we have Brandy Lewis, a SOAR program manager and SOAR local lead with the Outreach Community Health Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And we have SOAR beneficiaries joining um, both Tracy and Brandy um, in Jacksonville and Milwaukee. Um, and we're so excited um, to have this team here um, to tell you about uh, the incredible work that they're doing. And like we mentioned already, we'll have time at the end um, for questions and answers facilitated by our team. And so we'll go ahead and kick things off um, first with <clears throat> Tracy um, and Dr. Krishna um, to talk about the SOAR model and the benefits of medical collaboration. All right, thank you so much for the introduction, Kristen. Um, so my name is Abby Krishna and I'll be co-presenting with um, Tracy today. Um, without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. So today we're going to talk to you all about the SOAR model and the advantages of working closely with your medical counterparts to help connect your clients to necessary services. Um, to tell you all a little bit about Soulsbacher, it was first established in 1995 to target the rising national and local challenge of homelessness. And it was founded by a partnership of three organizations with the principle that homelessness is a complex challenge and needs more than just providing food and shelter. Um, and at Soulsbacher, we strive to provide a multifaceted approach from housing and finances to medical care. And over the last 20 plus years, our services have expanded to include primary care, behavioral and dental care, and increasing access to employment, permanent housing, and education. Um, so here we kind of have a more detailed list of medical services and just wanted to highlight that we have free outreach teams that try to increase access to free education, um, sorry, free medication, and we use a variety of outreach clinics to, ac to increase access to medical care. So we've got um, some of these mobile clinics listed below. Um, and some more uh, services that we provide. Um, so I actually worked heavily in the HOPE team where we provided psychiatric evaluations and treatment and administer long-acting antipsychotic injectables along with other psychiatric medication. And some more services listed here as well that we offer. And next, I will let Tracy go over more about the SOAR program specifically. So hi, the SOAR model is linked with housing services. So whenever I do a new intake for individuals on the SOAR model, they are always homeless or at risk of homelessness. And then on the treatment plan, I link them to housing. And at Schalsbacher, we also have our own housing services. So each night, Schalsbacher is home to over 400 men, women, families, and children. Um, the downtown campus, we have emergency housing for men. We have a medical respite and a veteran storm and rentals for men. At the Schalsbacher Village campus, there's emergency housing, a veteran storm, and affordable housing for both women and children and their family members. We also have scattered site housing throughout Jacksonville through our housing program with over 200 apartments throughout the county. So the SOAR program at Schalsbacher um, is partnered with the medical staff um, and the behavioral health staff. So since 2018, Schalsbacher, in partnership with LSF Health Systems, has provided SOAR case management services in collaboration with psychiatrists and, and other providers and physicians and specialists. So we have a, a medical and behavioral health clinic right here on campus. We also have a pharmacy and a dental clinic here on campus. So once an individual is enrolled into the um, SOAR program, they're able to get those integrated services and they get free medications because they don't have health insurance. 
So the benefits of collaborating with medical staff, such as the psychiatrists and physicians, is they are able to sign the medical summary report. And they're able to provide updated psychiatric evaluations and medical records, um, which prevents, uh, you know, Social Security requesting that we transport them to an outside evaluation. Um, they're able to prescribe psychiatric medications. They're able to complete the paperwork to assist applicants with um, obtaining representative payee services. And um, the SOAR case manager can also advocate for the applicants. A lot of times, the um, SOAR beneficiaries feel more comfortable with the case manager sharing about symptoms they're experiencing and what have you. And then the SOAR case manager is able to communicate that to the providers. So the, whoops. So the SOAR case manager creates treatment plan um, which the applicant or the SOAR beneficiary helps with this case manager. They complete it together, and there's always a medical, a financial, and a housing goal. An assessment is also completed, and um, the case manager notes what is needed for each individual. Um, clients are linked to the least restrictive housing placement. In some cases, um, with severe, if a client has a severe mental illness, they'll be linked to guardianship services. But for the most part, we try to put them into um, permanent supportive housing, but some of them do have to go into assisted living facilities, and some of them require guardianship through the state. Um, and I think the core SOAR case manager, a good role they have is to promote medication compliance. The so use of long-acting injectables really help them to become medication compliant, and the SOAR case manager can, uh, sorry, SOAR case manager can track when they're due and then they can make sure that the clients are coming in and getting those long-acting injectables. Yeah, and on the psychiatric side, we bring care to the SOAR clients where they are. Um, so we go to the streets, to uh, the shelters where the patients are, et cetera. And we can help prescribe psychiatric medication, including medications like long-acting injectables that Tracy mentioned. And these really, really help with promoting longitudinal psychiatric stability. And I briefly wanted to put in a plug for these long-acting injectables or LAIs. Um, which can be a really great tool to promote medication adherence in patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorders. And the research has actually shown that they can improve various medical and psychiatric outcomes um, from reducing suicide attempts, medical and psychiatric hospitalizations, and patients on the LAIs are less likely to experience antipsychotic side effects such as extrapyramidal symptoms when we compare to oral antipsychotic agents. Um, however, with any medical intervention, we always want to consider the benefits versus the risks. Though there are some disadvantages with the LAIs, like the very expensive costs and side effects and the requirement of the client needing to be willing to receive and continue the medication, even after they start to improve, it can be truly life-changing as it can improve medication adherence, reduce relapses, which can ultimately help reduce repeated episodes of arrests and homelessness. And another nice benefit is they're also administered less often, so we can really track that patients are on top of their medication. And in this way, just like Tracy had mentioned, it's really that partnership of case management and the medical providers to really make this work. And I'll let Tracy take it away. Okay, so this is Richard. He was one of the first graduates from the SOAR program, and he has really kind of helped me work with um individuals who have lived with homelessness for a long time and they're a lot of times they present as floridly psychotic so he helps to build a relationship with them or maybe we'll go out to eat or take them shopping and then once these individuals are approved 
for you know social security benefits and, and and their housing comes in he'll help them move into their home so last year for our major fundraiser richard was uh one of the promoters of the fundraiser and so we had this little video that you can look at on your own to help uh bring in recognition about the SOAR program but he really does a lot to help other people um encourage them you know to seek treatment to keep their doctor's appointments and just to provide support as they need just sometimes they just want to have someone to talk to that's not a staff member so he's there as their friend or somebody to talk to so he they really take well to Richard Richard, did you want to say anything? Oh, uh, yeah, I just believe that every homeless person deserves a second chance. And that second chance starts with Salzbacher. All right, and so this is our contact information. If anybody has any questions or, or wants more details about the programs available here at Salzbacher, they may email me or Dr. Krishna. All right. Well, special thanks to all three of you. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce Brandy Lewis, uh, SOAR Program Manager and SOAR Local Lead um, at the Outreach Community Health Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'll turn it over to you, Brandy. Hi, good afternoon, everybody from Milwaukee. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our SOAR program, um, specifically our agency and how we utilize SOAR and how we utilize our uh, physicians or clinicians uh, that work at the agency here with us. So my agency is uh, Outreach Community Health Centers. We were uh, initially founded as a healthcare for the homeless back in 1982 and with the ever growing needs of the community, um, it was kind of decided that we needed to uh, become a federally qualified health center or FQHC as we refer to it. Um, and that happened around 2011. And that is uh, officially when our SOAR program also uh, started here at Outreach Community Health Center. Um, our mission statement is to promote health and wellness to all of the individuals that we serve in our community. And our vision is to strive to be a trusted community health center by offering quality integrated care and services that pretty much address the social determinants of health of the members in our community. And while our foundation is primarily, primarily built on providing services to those who are experiencing homelessness, we've expanded our services to fit the needs of the community that we reside in. Um, the community that we reside in is um, statistically one of the poorest neighborhoods in Milwaukee. We even have a documentary called 53206 if you want to learn a little bit more about um, the community that we serve and the people that we serve. Um, our focus is to not only encapsulate those who are homeless, but those who are low income and um, don't have quality health care. So we did expand to have clinical and community services. On the clinical side, we have a primary care uh, wing that is complete with dental and podiatry. We also have um, a mobile dental clinic that um, also is able to kind of travel or be stationary so that clients can come in and go as they please. We also have uh, full behavioral health services on site, um, including psychiatry, psychotherapy, um, and then we also have a pharmacy that offers low cost prescription drugs or even free to those um, who can't afford it. Uh, there is a sliding fee that we also offer to folks who are underinsured. So they have insurance, but maybe it doesn't cover very much. So they're able to come here and um, get full healthcare services as well as their pharmacy needs taken care of. Um, on the other side of the house where I work in community services, we have three tiers of case management. Um, there is an upper tier, a middle tier, and a lower tier. And our SOAR program actually accepts referrals from all three. Um, 
even the lowest tier of case management here. Um, we it, it have very strict requirements to get into the, the case management program. So there has to be a mental health um, condition present. And then they also have to be, um, have co-occurring ALDA issues as well. So even though there are three different tiers um, that clients can sort of fit in all three levels, um, you know, are going to be potential for clients. We also have street outreach and housing along with our sister, our big sister program, PATH. Uh, we have an amazing street outreach team here that goes out on Thursday nights going into Friday morning to um, identify those who are homeless and could potentially benefit from our programs, um, specifically SOAR and maybe some of the other programs that we have here as well. And then the final program that we have in our community services division is our benefits acquisition uh, program. And that is the program in which I manage. It includes SOAR case management, and we also help individuals get health insurance as well as food share. We are often asked, what's the biggest advantages to having on-site medical providers? And I honestly cannot stress enough that it is really important to work with individuals who know and understand what SOAR is and how valuable it is to our consumers that we serve. Um, when we run into physicians that are not aware of what SOAR is, it does make the process a little harder, but I can kind of teach you um, some tips and tricks that we use to engage those providers in a couple slides. The SOAR program at Outreach Community Health Centers has been in existence since 2011. I've personally been on board since 2014. I handle all of our refer uh, referral sources we receive them both from external and internal. So our external referral sources are gonna look like shelters. Our biggest um, referral source would be the Salvation Army, the Emergency Lodge. We get a lot of consumers from there. Um, other social service agencies that are similar to outreach but that don't have SOAR embedded in them will also reach out to us. Um, workforce development programs such as um, the I am really trying a blank. Um, we use the DVR. That's what it is. The Department of Vocational Rehabilitation um, is a really big one. Uh, we developed that relationship uh, because we would refer some of our SOAR people over to the DVR to get um, evaluated so that we could use that also as medical evidence. And then finally, we also receive uh, referrals from Milwaukee County, specifically from their housing division for uh, individuals that are waiting to be placed or housed, but are in need of our SOAR services. Internal SOAR uh, referral sources are gonna come from our street outreach team and our PATH programs, any one of the case management programs that we discussed a little earlier, um, walk-ins, uh, which our beneficiary was a walk-in and that's how she came to us and she can kind of tell you a little bit about that process. And then we also um, accept referrals from our Milwaukee County Access Clinic as well as our own behavioral health department. So that's just a couple ways that, um, you know, someone can get referred to our program. When working with other or external medical providers, it can be extremely difficult to spread the word, especially when you don't have any contacts. Uh, one of the biggest things that you can do for yourself is to include a cover letter uh, with your medical records request um, that briefly explains what SOAR is and what work you're going to do and, and how we um, are going to potentially use those medical records. And then also that we will be sending back the medical summary uh, report that we're hoping that someone or their provider can actually read and sign if they agree with it. Um, you also want to utilize medical assistance, um, or MAs as we call them, by providing general information about the SOAR program. They have greater access to the providers than, than we could ever have. And so, you know, if they're able to kind of slide that report in or get a signature, um, they can definitely assist with doing that. They have a little bit more free time um, than a clinician that you may be working with. 
if the medical provider that you're working with, again, is, is unaware of SOAR, um, or they're aware of it, we can consider them a part of the care team. So here at Outreach, our providers, um, you know, attend our POC meetings or planning of care meetings uh, with clients. They have input. They also talk about clients' strengths and weaknesses among plan of care teams. Um, and this makes them a lot more readily available to sign those MSRs and to complete other medical provider forms if the DDB um, requires them. Um, we also have medical providers that um, are aware of what we actually need their, their medical notes for. So they tend to include a lot more information than they would um, otherwise. So sometimes they may just jot something for medical billing purposes only to protect clients or even themselves. Um, but when we have conversations with our providers, they're very aware that, um, you know, things that are being discussed, we, we, it's, it's really helpful if we actually see it on paper. Um, sometimes clients disclose things to us that they don't to their medical providers because we tend to see them in a more relaxed setting. Maybe we're going to their homes or we see them at the shelter. Uh, so we sometimes get information that may not be shared with uh, providers. So it is good if you have an ROI in place so that you can share information freely between providers and yourself and, and possibly other SOAR members so that you can strategize and, and kind of figure out where you want to go with a difficult case. So with that being said, um, I'm going to have our SOAR beneficiary, Rachel, talk a little bit about her process. She was a walk-in client um, that came to us and she didn't really have a whole lot of things in place. So um, along with myself and her assigned store case manager, Andrea Guardiola, um, we kind of helped Rachel out. So I will let her kind of talk about that. Hi. Can you see me? We can definitely see you. <laughs> oh, then. Yes, Rachel. Um, I'm Rachel and Miss Andrea, they have helped me out a whole lot. I have been on assistance for, I don't know how many years, but I have been stable, whatever. And if I need anything or, how can I say this? Uh, they just been helping a lot. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be where I am now. I am stable. I have a roof over my head. I have income coming in month to month and I am secure and I'm safe. And if I ever need anything and anyone to talk to, I can call them. They also set me up with um, medical assistance. I'm at Outreach on 2nd and Capital. I have a psychotherapist. I have a primary doctor. And I have medical ride. So everything is set up. And if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be where I am now. They are very helpful, and I thank God for that. Please move it. Thank you so much, Rachel. <laughs> Such a wonderful testament to the important work that they're doing at Outreach Community Health Centers, the way that they're um, impacting um, and transforming lives. So thank you to Brandy um, and the team there. Um, so Brandy, I don't want to cut you off. Um, whenever you're ready to come back on, definitely um, do so if there's more that you wanted to share. If I think it was a little overwhelming for her to kind of talk about the process. So um, I think she kind of maxed out on what she wanted to say. But this is my contact information. If anybody has any questions for me or they want to um, reach out to me with any questions, for sure. All right. Great. Thank you, Brandy. And thank you so much to Rachel. All right, so uh, thank you to our presenters. Uh, we've got a wonderful amount of time available to address your questions. So um, if our other panelists want to um, turn on your cameras or unmute when the questions come, we'll just go through um, and answer some of the questions that have um, come in already. 
from our participants. And if you haven't asked your question yet and you have additional questions um, that you'd like to submit, please type them into the Q&A box. Uh, you can add your questions there and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so one of the uh, first questions that came in was related to um, guardianship procedures and how they relate to SOAR claims if they impact the process or um, if that process can be expedited. And wondering if um, any of our panelists have experience with um, working with applicants who have a legal guardian in place and wanted to comment on that. Well, um, I often, so a lot of times my clients are homeless but they will have like, once I start working with them and obtaining their records, or sometimes I will schedule them to have a psyche eval with IQ testing, it becomes apparent that they need a guardian um, to maintain their stability. And so what I, it's separate from the uh, social security or SOAR process, if you will, but we take like a whole person centered approach. So what I do then is I fax a referral to the North Florida guardian and, um, that starts the process and then they'll send, it's usually in Tallahassee here in Florida, and then they'll send somebody to meet with me and we'll evaluate the person and he'll ask her some questions. And then they take it from there where they go before a judge, I'll submit medical uh, records. And this is where the psychiatrist comes in hand again, because they fill out a lot of the paperwork to submit to the agency that's, you know, petitioning for guardianship at the court level. Sorry, I know I went all around there, but does that kind of make sense? Or yeah, I think so. And I think it's helpful um, for the, the questioner to hear, you know, that these the process for guardianship and the process for applying for Social Security benefits are separate. Um, yeah, I think that's really helpful. I'll add just one, you know, note that. If there isn't a legal guardian in place, then the applicant is the, um, you know, the person who's applying, the individual is. Once that legal guardian, a court-appointed legal guardian is in place, then they are the proper applicant. Um, but until that time, it's still the individual. So power of attorney does not apply here. Um, the proper applicant would still be the individual until that legal guardian's in place. Just little regulation stuff, but if folks have other, like, really specific questions about that, definitely email us at the TA Center we can help out with that. And the process takes about a year. So I've already gotten the person usually approved, set up with a representative payee to manage their funds and in some form of housing prior to the guardianship taking place because it takes about a year to do so. And that's the emergency guardianship process. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, so a question came in um, that I think Dr. Krishna, you could help with, um, wondering about the long acting injectables um, and whether there's an offboarding for that or if folks are on for um, a long period of time, how that works. Yeah, so um, the challenge is these are lifelong disease processes and 99% uh, of the time they do require these injections for life. Um, we do know that uh, relapses when patients come off their medication make their disease harder to treat. So we really, really want to try to keep the medication going for as long as the patient is willing to continue it. Great. Thanks for that clarification. Um, all right. So uh, we've got some great questions about um, really the process of building collaborations with medical providers. Um, and so one uh, first question, and I think we, um, a number of you might be able to answer this one, is what can we do as SOAR providers in our communities to provide value to the medical providers to invite their support of this process and this application? So what can we do to provide value to those medical providers? Um, so I can take this question if that's all right. Yeah. Uh, so from our side of the, the story, I guess, um, you, you all have a really unique perspective because you often spend a lot more time with the patients than, than we have the time to in our brief visits with our patients. And so we get a full story when we speak to you all, and that collateral history is extremely valuable for us and we can really collaborate together to see how the medications are working and kind of see what information you need to help 
you know, get their services started for them. Great. Does anyone else want to kind of add to that or um, what things that we can do with medical providers to um, kind of identify, you know, points of leverage um, to help get support for claimants? Um, well, real quick, I just thought sort of Krishna is just so wonderful. She helps so much. I can't say enough about her. There are some clients, unfortunately, that even if they take the highest dose of a long-acting inje uh, injectable, they have treatment-resistant symptoms of schizophrenia. And so I had one client, I've had him for years, and he, and so she was able to prescribe him Clozaril. So, for, so, so not all clients are going to do well on the uh, long-acting injectables. For some more serious cases, Clozaril can kind of really help a lot. So, and she helped me with one client with that. So I just kind of want to let everybody know that sometimes not for, ever, for the more serious mental illness, sometimes the shots will not, or the long-acting injectables won't be enough. Okay, thanks. Um, so while we're on the topic um, of that medication, a question came in with, um, you know, the a question related to the effectiveness of long-acting injectables um, compared to pills or um, oral medication. And then also uh, related to that is, uh, you know, approaches to help um, clients, uh, you know, understand the, the best method for their long-term care, um, why they might want to consider a long-acting um, injectable instead of um, pills. Yeah. yeah, so I can take that one. Um, so it's really hard to uh, compare clearly between both because it's really a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but like Tracy was saying, when we do have treatment-resistant um, patients, we really find that sometimes clozapine is our biggest gun that we got. Um, however, that is an oral antipsychotic as well, and we kind of fall into the same challenge of, well, our patient is not willing to take a pill and can't you know, be expected to take it on their own every day. So we kind of try to work with the tools that we have. Um, but in, in my anecdotal experience, uh, I have found that they are extremely effective because we can guarantee that the patient is getting the medication and that it's in the system. Um, so it, it is largely really effective. Mm -hmm. Is it okay if Richard shares his experience about the long acting injectables? That would be excellent. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Yeah, I, I just don't have to uh, worry about taking a pill every day. Um, there's minimum side effects. I mean, I have a little soreness in my arm and uh, and a small headache, but other than that, um, the the benefits of a long term injectable outweigh more than the the cons of an injectable yeah yeah so he's once he started taking that long acting injectable he's there were no more hospitalizations so you know he's just done wonderful since then so it's it's helped a lot for him great Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Um, we had a, another follow-up question. Um, would this work well with um, clients who have um, a substance use disorder-based schizophrenia? I think is what the uh, questioner was asking. Would it um, be effective for those individuals as well when there's substance use involved? Yeah, so um, it's very interesting because we know that certain substances can definitely exacerbate underlying conditions like psychosis and bipolar disorder. So it's really hard to say what the true underlying causes of their presentation are. Um, but oftentimes it can help folks um, continue to stay in recovery because they're more likely to be in control and a lot of times we find that with relapses, people often tend to use more. Um, so when we do have these comorbid diagnoses, it is really helpful to have that on board too. Great, thank you. Um, so we have some uh, you know, questions about 
Um, medical providers that might be unwilling um, at first to sign a medical summary report. Um, and uh, sorry, the questions just jumped around a second with me. Um, so they you know, they might not be sure that everything in there is exactly accurate. And maybe they say they don't have time to read it. Um, it doesn't happen. Um, and you know, some a lot of agencies actually, so our agencies don't have doctors on site. So what advice would you have about you know talking with um, doctors that aren't part of the um, you know SOAR providers agency about about the medical summary report and and co-signing that? And this could be for Dr. Krishna or also, you know, Brandy, if you've had any experience with, you know, getting outside physicians to co-sign or Tracy, you too. Um. Um, yeah, sure. I was just answering questions in the chat box. Um, I've done a lot of like physically going to um, hospital systems, um, you know, asking, hi, who handles the medical records, getting their name, getting their email, um, you know, having to like physically go up there and just really making that connection. I find once they see you, um, oftentimes, you know, they, they're making a rapport with you and I get a little bit more give when I actually go there um, and, and just send like a thank you email and, and follow up and say, hey, you know, I really appreciate it, you know, speaking with you today. Thanks for the records or, or whatever. Thanks, Brandy. I think that helps a lot too. That in-person connection, um, for sure. Yeah, and I guess I can speak uh, to that from the medical provider perspective. Um, again, uh, you all are really valuable with your history that you see about what the patient is doing outside of our visits. Um, and you all often have seen the patient longitudinally. Um, and it just helps from our end to see the records specifically for um, psychiatric hospitalizations or outside clinical records so we can see what they looked like when they presented and kind of um, the medications that they required to get to this point. And that really helps us, you know, make sure that we build the correct picture of the patient so that they can get the appropriate services. Great, thank you. Um, so this question is for uh, the SOAR providers, um, how you do your kind of eligibility determination and identifying applications. So when folks come to your program and you're determining whether or not you'll um, be able to provide them with a SOAR assistance on their disability application, what's that process like for you? Um, well, I usually, um, I have referrals coming from all different directions, so I usually just meet with the individual, or if I'm doing outreach, I'll go out to them and kind of just ask them questions, and, you know, like, did you have special ed, or, or, you know, have you had any hospitalizations, and some of them, the way they present it becomes kind of apparent that they would qualify, for, like if they had schizophrenia. And the good thing about that is, is I can link them right up to a doctor who I can say, hey, I really want you to see this person and Dr. Krishna because she was outreach can go do a psychiatric evaluation and then we could get them started on the injection. And it's, it's like, it's, it's so wonderful when I see somebody on the injections because it's like that person comes back, you get to see them come back and it's, and you see them have housing and it's, I can't describe that, but it's just like they, you start to see who they are, I guess. Absolutely. Um, pretty much my process is if, if I get an external referral, I work a lot on the front end. So I will request records if I have the signed ROI. Um, I do um, like an eight page intake assessment with the client before I assign them to one of my source specialists or I decide to keep the case for myself. Um, so I'm kind of just, you know, picking their brain. If they remember things, they great. If they don't, you know, I tell them, don't worry about it. We're kind of, kind of, you know, peel back those layers. Um, I also contact the um, local offices and we request what we call um, an earning statement. They call it a DQI. 
and we do that uh, because we kind of build in a segment where we're going over their work history. Sometimes they don't have one at all. Um, sometimes, you know, I've worked with a woman that was 30, but she's had 48 jobs in the span of 15 years. So we could definitely use that to, to show that she's fine with getting the job. It's just that she has a history or, you know, a really tough time of actually keeping that job. If a client has a, a, um, applied before in the past and they've been denied, we can order a uh, prior decision CD. Um, you can do that by um, completing a, a consent, a release for consent of information from Social Security, um, and they, they actually have it on there that you can request a prior decision CD. Um, and, and basically what that does is it houses a document or any anything that was sent on their behalf when they applied before in the past. And then there's also um, a document from the DDB that explains like flat out why they were denied. And I found that that's been extremely helpful with appeals for us. Um, on the front end, it's pretty good. It's, it's very helpful with appeals um, because that um, it, it's going to outline exactly why this client was denied, whether it was a paper trail. Sometimes they can be hard to read for clients, so I don't recommend doing that in front of the client. This is more so a tool for you. Um, you know, it could say anything. I was called a malingerer in one of those because a client disclosed information to me that they did not share with their provider. Um, so that helped me plan for the appeal in that I got a provider switch um, to someone that he was more comfortable speaking with. And he ended up telling them the same things that he told me and he was approved in four months after that. So um, those are just a couple of the things that we might do um, to work a case on the front end. And then I go ahead and assign it and then we start the SOAR process. So um, I do work a little further ahead than the 60 days. I kind of do 90, but that's just our personal process, the way that we do it here. No, that's uh, excellent, Brandy. Thank you so much for the detail about the development that you do um, for the application. That can be so important uh, to know what's happened in the past and how you can really address that to um, kind of see success in your, your current um, application. So that's great. Thanks. Um, so we um, have some questions related to medical records. So I'll try to kind of um, combine a little bit. So um, there's kind of a trend in questions about, you know, um, issues or struggles with accessing records and, you know, any suggestions about, you know, communicating to medical records departments and others about the importance of records or trying to get those records quickly. And then um, to just kind of preview of, second side of that question is how do we make sure that those records um, have in them what we need to document the claim? And so this is more the medical provider level piece of this is how, you know, if um, sometimes uh, there was an example provided in the Q&A um, that the doctor might document that the client is doing fine, um, that all is good, um, but in fact, they really are struggling. And so then the record doesn't reflect, you know, what's really happening with them um, and just strategies to, to help address that. Yeah, so I guess it's kind of uh, the different goals uh, from you guys from case manage management versus from us from the provider. Um, I guess I will say personally, in my experience, when we say that the patient is doing fine, we look at their psychiatric stability, not necessarily their functional ability. Um, so if you would like the provider to include functionally how they're doing, they can try to front load that and make sure that they ask that um, in their interview during their appointment so they can document, you know, the information that you guys are requiring. Um, in terms of what I look for with medical records, um, really the hospital discharge summaries are extremely helpful to me and especially their initial presentation, like it'll say like the history and physical because that tells me like if it was an involuntary psychiatric hospitalization, how they presented, what symptoms were going on. And usually if the inpatient teams like called other family and things like that, they'll usually document that in the first visit. Um, but it can be helpful to get the hospital course as well to kind of get the day to day. Um, but the biggest things that we wanna know are how they uh, came in and then 
what kind of happened during the hospitalization, which is usually in the hospital discharge summary. Hope that helps. Thanks, Dr. Krishna, it does. Uh, Tracy or Brandy, any suggestions you have about, you know, strategies you've used in collecting medical records when you've followed up a bunch of times, you're not hearing back, what do you, what do you do? Well, I have one situation where the individual, he has a heart problem and uh, an intellectual disability. And I guess when he had applied before, somebody didn't report that he was in special education. So then he had just been denied before a judge and, and now I'm restarting the case um, like a year later. And the problem was whoever the psychologist he was sent to to be evaluated that was sent by Social Security put, he was malingering. And so he was denied. So now that I have it, I found that there are special ed records and it's in Georgia, which is about an hour from where I live. And Social Security keeps requiring us and see Social Security didn't know he had special ed before. So Social Security keeps requesting them. I kept requesting them. Finally, I got somebody on the phone yesterday and I said, do you have the records? I go, wait, right there, I'm coming to get them. So I did have to drive an hour there and an hour back, but I got the records. I faxed them in and then the doctor, was, as I believe, reviewed the case yesterday afternoon. So sometimes it's a matter of making sure Social Security gets the correct information because a lot of times it's just they don't have the whole story. Now, I don't always do that, but that just popped in my head because it just happened. But sometimes you have to do what it takes to get it done, I guess. <laughs> yeah, thanks for going above and beyond. Brandy, did you have anything you wanted to add about medical record strategies? Um, we have the biggest time with getting medical records from our prison systems here in Wisconsin. It That's uh, one of the biggest thorns in our side here in Wisconsin. Um, so what I did was I went to uh, one of the ones that were local, um, what we call it House of Corrections here in Franklin. Um, and I was able to speak with a person up front who gave me uh, a list of a couple names that I could kind of go and and that's how we actually got our contact into uh, the DOC here in Wisconsin. So it's not always that easy. Um, you're not always going to get it on the first try. It might be the second or the third or the fourth or the fifth person that you talk to. Um, but certainly when you once you get it, uh, what we like to do is kind of keep a notebook full of our contacts and our fax numbers that work just so that you can share them with the next person. That's great, thank you. Um, all right, so I think there's some other um, kind of questions uh, related to um, working with doctors in facilities about um, the kind of requirements that Social Security is looking for um, in the medical records um, and that it's those requirements are perhaps more extensive than what's documented in the record um, or if you've got <clears throat> other questionnaires or forms to fill out. Um, I guess I'm thinking about, you know, feedback on strategies related to kind of addressing that need or maybe communicating with uh, doctors about um, what would be important to be in in the record or, or on these, um, in this documentation to help support the claim. Thoughts about that? Or tell me if that didn't come out totally clear either. Um, so I guess from my end, again, it really, really helps, especially working with Tracy because she's so clear in what she needs and what needs to be reflected in the uh, paperwork that we complete. And that really helps us so we can kind of, um, you know, focus in on the most important aspects that uh, Social Security needs to know for the, for it to be approved. Awesome. You summarized that great. Um, all right. I mean, I think the bottom line is that this kind of the communication, this clear collaboration between the SOAR provider and, you know, the medical provider directly um, can make such a difference. So, great. Um, all right. So let me see it through these questions here. Wondering if, if any of our presenters, if you've seen questions going through the chat, I know Brandy, you mentioned you were answering some, but any that you wanted to kind of verbalize uh, that you had answered or 
uh, things that you saw coming up that you wanted to highlight or spotlight? I, oh, I'm sorry, Brandy. No, I, I, oh. I think I've kind of gone and, and answered most of the ones that I, I could. I'm, I'm still answering, but. Well, so if you wanted to, yeah, share any of that verbally, Brandy, I know everyone's not uh, reading in the Q&A, so I'd love to. Oh, gotcha. I just yeah. got a, a, a lot of questions about um, the form that um, you can use to request that information. That is called an SSA 3288. It is a consent for release of information. Um, I use this form for a lot of different um, things. You could use it to um, uh, ooh, get medical records that they received on behalf of the person if they've ever pl applied before in the past. That's for the um, DQE. You would have to, to check box number nine and, and specifically state that you want a DEQY, which is the earning statement. Um, but that is someone just asked what the, the form for that was. So it's an SSA 3288. And typically it has to be signed by the client. Um, depending on what programming they're in at your agency, they could accept your signature. But that's typically the form that we would use to do that. Um, I saw a question about IQ testing, and that was a good question. Mm -hmm. You can also call the DDS and request that they have an IQ test, and, and about 80% of the time they'll do that. If not, it's usually about $350, and we use I, our agency, Charles Bacher, uses a, a psychologist that's approved by Social Security because they have different ones that are approved. And it's about 350. And so there's different things you can work out with the client. Sometimes there's funding to pay for that, or you can work with different grants or something, or sometimes the client may agree to reimburse it if they're approved. And if they have a payee, the payee could reimburse the provider. Yeah, like Tracy said, um, we do have a line item in our budget in case someone needs to be sent for that. Uh, we typically don't have to because we will send them to the, the DVR, the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation, so you can look and see if your state um, DVR would offer that service. So it's, it's kind of a free way to do that. But, um, you know, if there are things that are that cost extra, you can definitely try to see if you can work it into your budget. At one point, we even had um, the cost for marriage certificates in our budget because we had a, a gentleman, his wife was deceased and we needed to get her death certificate and her birth certificate. So there are things, you know, like that, um, that you can just kind of work in and see if, if the budget would be willing to cover it. Thanks. Um, all right, so there was a question, um, this is more kind of general SOAR related question, but since Tracy and Brandy are such experienced SOAR providers, folks are wondering, you know, how many um, folks do you have on a caseload at a time? What does that look like for you and, and other SOAR providers in your agencies? Our uh, local SOAR offices are very backed up uh, due to COVID and them working home. Um, so they're telling folks that we're going like 15 months out to get a decision um, unless they have a special circumstance. So, um, you know, our caseloads, I typically sign two case, assign two cases a month. Um, so you would have 24 for calendar year but they, they tend to roll over. So you could have, uh, you know, 20 or 30 clients that are active at once, but you're just not doing that sort of progress because, you know, it's, it's kind of in the DDB hands and we're waiting to see what's mm -hmm. going to happen with that. Um, but, you know, you could have anywhere from 12 to 30 folks on, on a caseload at any given time here at Outreach. Thanks, Brandy. Tracy, how about you guys? Yes. Um, what I do is I have them flagged as homeless or at risk of homelessness, and that pushes them to the front of the line uh, with DDS. So our turnover is usually most cases are, are, you know, decided in less than six months. So as I would say about two months, three months and, and decisions been made there. And, I, and, and yeah, I would say about 20 to 30 cases. I try to close them out and then open them, close them out so it's hard to, to keep track. But yeah, definitely I'm I'm required to have 28 intakes per year. So I at least have to have 28 per year. All right. Yeah, those are great, really manageable numbers. Um, and would say, you know, just 
generally to all of you out there um, that that's what we you know recommend that you're able to really provide good quality um, thorough applications if you're keeping your numbers um, lower like that so excellent um, all right, there was a question um, about what happens if a medical provider says, you know, no, I'm not going to co-sign your medical summary report. Uh, you know, you haven't convinced me all of these wonderful things you've said. Um, so what would you recommend in this case? Like, what would you, what do you do if someone says, no, they're not going to co-sign or support the application? What I typically do is um, in my conclusion statement, um, you know, I will say that I um, attempted to, to reach their provider, but you know, with due to volume, they were, you know, unable to read and sign it and, you know, just try to make it seem like they, they just wouldn't sign it due to time constraints and I really just had to give it over there. So that's typically what I do um, pretty much all we can do at that point. Yeah, right. yeah thanks. I've had the facts of metal full summary reports over with maybe the doctor wasn't available, went on maternity leave or what have you. And I've faxed them over and the DBS has been good about um, receiving them. Um, I know a lot, a new listing that's came up in the past few years is neurodevelopmental disorder. So um, I have some, I've talked to some psychiatrists that are a little apprehensive about that listing. So I just showed them the listing on social security, printed out the criteria and then they're pretty open to it now. Great. Yes, like um, in terms of me, in terms of rejections, uh, typically we do like to see the client at least twice because <laughs> a lot of times I feel like there are some clients who are just there just to get one benefit and aren't really motivated or interested in getting the rest and sticking with the medical care. And sometimes it, I remember, Tracy, there was this one case where she was getting double benefits from several people already, and it didn't come to our attention until after we did the initial psychiatric evaluation. Um, so it would be awesome, you know, if there is a rejection, if you guys just reach out to us and ask us why, so then we can kind of work together to problem solve and figure it out. <laughs> Thanks, that makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, we have a, another question that came in and you guys are great with sending in your questions. Oh my gosh, participants, thank you. Um, so how do you help clients recognize the value of ongoing treatment, counseling, medication? So some people don't wanna participate in treatment, but they do wanna submit a claim that's based just on their um, inpatient hospitalizations. So just kind of that engagement, motivational interviewing that you do, what do you do? Um, so you're saying how the SOAR case manager builds a rapport and, and maintains? Yeah, I mean, I would say both the SOAR case manager and, you know, medical providers. So for Dr. Krishna, okay. too, about, you know, talking with individuals about, you know, the value of, of treatment and engaging in treatment for people who might not be ready yet for that. Uh, so I can kind of speak briefly to that. Um, a lot of times we kind of figure out what is important in their life. So if, you know, ch they have children and having stability is important, we kind of are like, hey, you know, this is really affecting your kids. You know, they can't have a stable home if you're constantly getting uh, big granted and getting sent to the hospital. Um, it's really, you know, think about how this affects other important people in your life. Um, and I know that I really love the techniques that Tracy uses her magic to kind of really persuade people. And I think that also thinking about the benefits of being off the streets and having um, food and shelter and those basic needs and kind of using those sometimes as motivation. Um, we can't do that ethically, <laughs> um, but I know that we can kind of work with other things to, to motivate people um, to get the goal that they want and also get their health in line as well. Great, thanks. Tracy or Brandy, anything that you would want to add to that? 
about things that you do? All right, that's great. Oh, Brandy, would you? <laughs> no, okay. Um, all right, so we do have, um, there's a few questions in the chat. Um, I'm just recognizing to those uh, questioners, we will um, answer your questions offline. Um, anything that's uh, coming in that's a little more case specific, we'll be sure to, to get to you um, if we don't uh, answer it live um, today. Um, so, Maybe uh, let's do one more kind of programmatic question that's come in and we'll end a little early today, have some found time for folks. Um, so this is for the programs, because I mean, I think for both um, the Soulsbacher Center and um, Outreach Community Health Center that you all have great SOAR programs. So I'm wondering about um, the funding streams that are used for your SOAR positions. And then um, if you have been involved with this, anything that you've done to attract and retain staff for your programs. Either you want to know about that. Tracy or Brandy, are you either of you familiar with the funding for your programs? Yeah, so my position is funded by uh, SAMHSA through LSF. And then there's also other grants that help complement it. But our main funding comes from SAMHSA for the uh, SOAR position. Um, our funding comes from the state, and I also believe that um, because we are an FQHC, we get federal dollars, um, you know, to service uh, low-income families or underinsured families, so I think a lot of our match comes from that. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, that was a, a marathon of questions, so I want to give you all a break from that and um, just thank you so much for the time that you put into uh, your presentations and answering everyone's questions. So um, a reminder to all of our participants on the webinar, you can reach out to your um, Sortier Center liaison with any other specific questions that you have. Um, and uh, the, you can find all of our contact information and the link in the chat there. Um, we have some additional resources available for all of you to check out. Um, so we have a document called What Medical Providers Need to Know About SOAR, um, which provides some um, just basic information about Social Security disability benefits, eligibility for them, um, things that will help uh, to understand um, how the process works, uh, how disability benefits work. Um, and it's a great supplement to the one-on-one -on -one communication that you may have with the medical provider as you uh, talk through the process and, and what your ask is of them. Um, we have tools on um, collecting medical records, so that's sort of critical component, which is, you know, key to this, and lots of our questions were related to that, and of course, the medical summary report links to our um, tools and worksheets and um, understanding and documenting um, substance use disorders for SOAR claims is another kind of key piece of information there. And uh, that brings us to the end. Um, so thank you again um, to all of our panelists and uh, participants who uh, took the time to join us today. Um, we'll definitely uh, get any unanswered questions um, answered to you in follow-up uh, via email. And we hope you will all uh, take a moment to complete the evaluation, which you'll see when you exit the webinar. Um, your responses will definitely help to inform our future webinar topics. Um, so on behalf of the SAMHSA Sortier Center, just thank everyone for joining again. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us anytime uh, with questions that you have. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again on our next webinar, which will be April 25th. And that'll be on building and sustaining relationships with the Social Security Administration and Disability Determination Center. Services. So hope to see you then. And in the meantime, take good care. Thanks, Tom. <laughs>